Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, can everybody hear okay? Volumes okay? Okay, good. I'm Bob Wells. I'm the current president of the Audubon Society of Omaha. Um, and this is our monthly uh, general education meeting. Uh, we have been doing Zoom meetings now for about three or four months, and, and it's become obvious that it's something that we have to get better acquainted with because we're going to have to do it here for a little bit more time. Um, a couple things, just general Audubon things. It's been a couple, busy couple of months. This fall, we moved into a new office space, uh, primarily because it had a, a warehouse space, and that uh, derived into a... Uh, a uh, well-promoted birdseed sale that we sold more birdseed than we have in any other previous year. And it kind of consolidated a bunch of uh, residential garages and it helped some people who were, had been uh, uh, with every, every, every one of our 40 years of birdseed sale and they were getting old enough to where throwing 50 pound bags of birdseed around were probably not something that they needed to be doing. So it worked out really well. And just to let everybody know who may not be acquainted with that, we're going to have an, uh, uh, essentially a late winter uh, birdseed sale in February, mostly to stock up for, for spring birdseed sale. Tonight, we have the pleasure of having somebody that I know pretty well and have worked with in the past um, give a very interesting uh, talk about uh, using specific plants for birds in, you know, in improving your habitat. J Jason St. Sevier is at the uh, 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 Audubon, Nebraska uh, state educator, and he has a, a lot of uh, facility and a lot of variety of talks that he gives, and, and they've all been excellent that I've heard. And I can't um, say enough about how well he's he's done, and, and he, he will never say this, but I attended the Audubon National Convention with him, and he is the, the current reigning uh, National Audubon Educator of the Year. So he is, people, other people have recognized that just other than just us in Nebraska. So without any further ado, I'll, I'll let him take over and he can begin his talk here. And thank you for coming. Thanks so much, Bob. <laughs> I didn't wear my sash. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Um, well, thanks again, everybody, for inviting me. I am thrilled to be here. Um, as Bob said, I am the education manager at Spring Creek Prairie Audubon Center, which is uh, one of the two Audubon centers in the state uh, for Audubon, Nebraska. So um, normally, if I was able to do this talk in person, um, I love to do a little poll on, you know, who knows what in the audience, and I tell you a little bit more. Um, it's harder to do on Zoom. Um, to get some of those reactions. So by, you know, bear with me as we go through. Um, if you do have questions as we go through, or if you don't understand something, um, feel free to drop that into the chat. I know, I believe Sarah is checking on that and she can uh, break in if it's something that fits right when I need to and I need to re-explain, or hopefully we'll have time for some uh, fun questions and answers at the end. Um, I've got a nice little presentation put together, um, hopefully entertaining and informational on um, Audubon's National Plants for Birds initiative. Um, and it's a really great and fun way, especially even though we're going into the winter season, to start planning now what you can do first thing when those thaws happen next year um, to uh, really make some uh, important habitat for uh, birds and bugs and uh, other wildlife that is both enjoyable and really important. So I think with that, uh, we will get moving and talk a little bit about plants for birds. All right, so let's see, I gotta do this. So real quick, for those that might not know, some of the early information in this presentation, many of you may know, but it's always good to reiterate and uh, just to have everybody remember some of the important things. This slide just um, shows you what our top five priorities in the National Audubon Society are right now. These are the strategic priorities that we work on across the country. A little less coast work right here in Nebraska, of course, right? <laughs> but we, um, and me especially, work on bird-friendly communities a lot, right? Making all of our communities, especially larger urban areas, a little friendlier for birds. And that can be um, 
making sure our buildings right are have bird strike stickers so that there's less bird strike. It could be making sure we have clean water, um, enough resources, and what we're going to talk about tonight, the Plants for Birds community uh, program. So really what this Plants for Birds program, where it came out of, and we're going to talk about sort of the inspiration for it a little later in the um, talk, but it really came from the idea of how do we meet in cities, right? New types of habitats over the past hundred years. How do we meet the needs for birds in those areas, right? And birds need a lot of the same things that people do to live, right? Food, water, shelter, safe passage, right? That can be like when they're migrating through and a really great safe place to raise their young, right? Those are pretty basic. Everybody knows those, right? Even though those burrowing owls in the picture look angry about it, they're actually not. That's just their face. <laughs> They've got a really great um, habitat right there put in by a researcher, a scientist to help them because the habitat is disappearing. A lot of this also stems from the recent studies, which many of you have probably seen, um, on how many birds we've lost, right? Over the past 50 years, right, it's like one in four birds. It's uh, almost three billion, the number is. That's pretty staggering. And when you look at the data closer, um, especially for us here in Nebraska, grassland birds are the hardest hit. Grasslands are, there's just not much grassland left, especially not large extent areas of prairie and grassland for these types of birds, right? Like our meadowlark, our state bird, like the bobolinks, like so many of the sparrow species. Um, if you see that stat, like that's pretty rough. Right, and it's the roughest one. The only thing that comes close is coastal birds out on the seashores um, with habitat loss, sea level rise as well. Partly, and again, the main reason, there are many reasons we're losing a lot of these birds, but one of the biggest, of course, is habitat loss. We're lucky in Nebraska because we do still have some contiguous landscapes like this, right? The Sand Hills, beautiful area. Um, even if though it's privately held, if a lot of the ranchers and the private landowners are using it, you know, thinking about not only maybe grazing in cattle or other uses, but also wildlife, there's still a lot of great habitat there. But we tonight are going to focus on that because that is becoming the most populous habitat pretty much on the planet. Right? We have gone over half of the US is developed. And that number I think was from 2017 or 16 when this presentation was first put together. So that's probably even bigger now, right? As we continue to grow in our cities. Um, and if just looking at that picture, everybody, right? Do you see a lot of bird habitat there? I don't, right? Except for maybe house sparrows, starlings, right? Nothing wrong with those friends, but the, it could be a lot better. The other stat to remember about suburban and urban areas is this one. This one shocked me. I didn't even know that as someone who works on this daily, that it was that high. 80% in urban areas of what is planted isn't native. And we're gonna talk about why that is probably not the best. Now, what I like to do is, and I didn't create this, I'd love to say I did, but I got this from one of my favorite books when I was researching this topic which is I would rather uh, create that. <laughs> Instead of suburbia, I would like it to be suburbia where we and the birds and wildlife can figure out how to have a habitat together and not be people only. There's some really easy ways that you can create suburbia and that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. So of course, native plants are just ultimately better, right? And when I say native, uh, there can sometimes be a little difference in what that means to some people, um, but basically what that means is a plant that evolved in this country. We can be specific for an ecosystem, right? That's usually better if we want to talk a prairie native plant in Nebraska or a upper plains native plant. But as long as it is something that evolved here in the United States, that's usually what we're considering when we're saying the word native plant. And they just are better. And I'll show you why. Just like people, right? My four food groups are carbohydrates, 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 and sugar. 
but birds have a better balanced diet. They're for food groups, right? Berries and fruits, very important right now at this time of year, especially, right? As the berries are starting to freeze, they're getting to be like wine. The robins can start getting a little tipsy. Really, really cool, but really great to get those sugars as birds are heading south, right? When they've got to go a long way, they've got to have that quick energy and berries are a great way for that. So berries and fruits, very important. Nuts and seeds, these are the ones that are really important now through the rest of the winter, especially for our resident birds, like that little down woodpecker that just showed up there, eating some great sunflower seeds or some cone, um, pine seeds, um, some nuts, right? Some peanuts, if you put those out, some almonds, all kinds of great um, native seeds and nuts. Nectar, of course, not happening now, but south of us, very important. Fun fact to think about, nectar might be what a lot of the birds we see all summer are switching to, right? We don't think of that, right? Because they come up here like the Baltimore Oriole all summer. They actually are a big nectar feeder in their wintering grounds too, down in Central America and South America. Anyone know what that last one is? Because it's the most important. And there was a big clue on that last slide. This is where if we were all in, per in person, you'd all probably be able to shout it out. But I'm going to assume you just did in your own homes. <laughs> it is bugs, insects, right? The most important food for almost all the bird species, except for the large raptors. Look at this. This is even a raptor, right? Small one, a um, little kestrel there. Um, but look at that stat. Again, I, I call myself the bird nerd. I pride myself in knowing so much about our uh, bird friends but I didn't know it was that high. I knew insect life was important to our birds, but look at that. 96% of North American land birds have to feed their young to survive insects, especially caterpillars, right? They are just packed with proteins and other nutrients for that little fledgling to be able to grow fast enough to be able to get uh, uh, old enough and feathers formed enough to get out of the nest. So that's an important stat. So really, if you think about it, even though we call it plants for birds, it's really plants for bugs. We are supporting a important full ecosystem by having native plants, which brings the bugs in. The birds and other animals will eat them and be healthy. And really, really, uh, it's, an, it's just, a, I can't stress how important that is. Um, real quick stat, and this comes from, if you haven't read it, I know many of you probably have, there's a great author, Doug Ptolemy, who has a brand new book now called Nature's Best Hope. If you haven't picked it up, it's really, really great. It goes further into what we're talking about uh, now. But tonight, it's this one, which is um, Bringing Nature Home. And a lot of the stats you'll see tonight came from that book. So on the left, you have, and this kind of just illustrates the point, you've got a really cool native oak tree. And that can support up to 557 different species of caterpillars. On the right, the picture you see is a ginkgo, not native, beautiful tree, right? But not native. And because North American caterpillars did not co-evolve with it, look what it supports, only about five. So if you have, if you just take those two examples, which one do you think your local cardinals, chickadees, when they need to feed young, are going to need to go to, right? They're going to go to that oak tree unless there isn't anything else uh, available. Here's just a few more that add to that stat, right? Look at those really great native trees in there and how many different caterpillars they can support. And this is my favorite, right? Those crazy little alien baby chick birds. These are black capped chickadees. Looks like five, three eggs and two uh, hatchlings already. But look at that stat. And if you're better at math, you can probably do this faster than I can. But if nestling chickadees eat 300 to over 500 caterpillars a day, that's over 9,000 caterpillars until they fledge. That's just one nest. Think about just in your neighborhood, like how many chickadees you know are around, right? Or like, think about, I know most of you have probably been out to Fontenelle Forest in the area. Think about how many chickadees and titmice, which are cousins, right, are just in that area. And then multiply that by 9,000. 
That's how many caterpillars to be able to get those little ones out of the nest. That's a lot of bugs that those birds are eating. And that's just those two species. So just like it gets huge exponentially really, really fast. So it's really important to have native plants supporting the native insects, right? For the larva, for the food, so that our friends, the birds that we wanna see, that we wanna hear can get out of the nest and come back the following year or stay here if they are resident species like these chickadees. That side pretty much speaks for itself. Lovely little robins, but if you look in her bill, again, worms are pretty tough. They're really super food for robins, but they're big. They're really strong and hard to pull out of the ground. And a lot of times the babies until they're much larger aren't getting worms, they're getting insects. So here's what you can do. One of the reasons I love the Plants for Birds program is, is it speaks to helping birds, helping insects and pollinators which are in trouble, and in a smaller way, not a huge way as other things, right? Getting rid of you know, our attachment to fossil fuels, but can still help the climate. So if you're like me, sometimes it gets overwhelming. There's so many things we need to tackle to help with wildlife, conservation, birds, et cetera. Um, what I enjoy about the Plants for Birds program is, is it's simple, small steps. You can start small and it builds that really do make a big difference. One of them is don't have that, what you see on the screen, right? A lot less turf grass and a lot less mowing of it constantly is a very simple step that you can do. I wanna recommend that book right there. We have them at Spring Creek. So if you don't have it, you can also get it online from the National Wildlife Federation. David Mizajewski there is an amazing naturalist that is on tons of TV shows, um, educating about wildlife across the country. He came to Nebraska two years ago for Crane Festival and spoke to us about Plants for Birds. Um, what I love about his book, and we're gonna mention it as we go through the rest of the night is, it is for all ages and it has pretty much everything you need. It's an enjoyable book, but it is also like a manual, a fun manual on how to do this from a really small butterfly garden in your yard to landscaping your whole huge yard if you've got a property. Um, for wildlife, there's activities that families, um, grandparents can do with kids. It's really, really a fun book on trying to get more birds, butterflies, and backyard animals uh, in your yard. What do you see? So we've kind of talked about the why. So now we're going to talk about the how. Does anybody see a few things wrong with this picture? thinking about what we just talked about. And again, if we were in person, you could be shouting these out and I'm hopefully you're thinking them to yourself right now, but some things to notice are many of those species are not native to the United States, right? They're lovely landscape trees. And again, I wanna stress, that doesn't mean you can't have them. Just think about variety, right? Or maybe less of them and more native ones when you're choosing. Another thing to notice is it's pretty sparse, right? There's big areas of turf grass around, right? With big broad grass, you know, um, sprayer going, probably wasting a lot of water that it doesn't need to spray. There's no shade tree up above. There's nothing marking those windows for window strike. There's a whole lot of what I would consider as extra mulch that maybe isn't necessary. So to me, there's lots of things that could be better, especially if we're thinking about um, landscaping or areas around our house that would be better for birds and bugs. What about instead that? Now that's the other extreme, right? This may not be for everybody, I get that. But just think about having even a small patch of this in your front yard, how that would benefit you and wildlife. Here's a few of the ways. Resources for the resident birds, right? Those bugs, not just to the bugs, right? But habitat to live in, to nest in, to hide in, et cetera, get out of a storm for both our resident birds and the birds that are migrating through. When you have native plants, this is something I love to stress for those that think it's difficult. It actually ends up being easier. Once you get native plants established, you use less resources and you save money. They can be sometimes, not always, 
but getting and finding native plants can be a little tricky. But once they're in the yard, they need less water. They need less gas because you don't have to mow them right as much. You usually leave them the way they are. And we hope that you use less pesticide on them, which then that doesn't run off and get in the water. You're not killing other bugs or grasses that maybe you didn't want to. Um, it's a really cool way to save and help the environment um, by having native plants. They're pretty drought hardy, especially if they are Nebraska native plants. They support way more pollinating insects. And we know not only the monarch, but many of our pollinators are in trouble. The one that I love is the regal fritillary, prairie specialist, right? So having some prairie violet. Um, it is hard to get in cities, but if you have a um, property that is in the edge, not really in suburbia, but like further out, a little on the uh, edges or out in the uh, meadow somewhere, possibly meadow violet will grow there. And obviously the one that I love, tracking more birds. There's a, just a quick page picture from, uh, again, David Mizajewski's book showing you kind of what he talks about. And again, the reason I put that on there is start small. Sometimes um, when I do this presentation or people will be, they will say, well, but I can't do my whole yard in prairie or I don't, you know, I don't think I can handle my whole backyard. What about the ticks? And I don't know if I want many more bugs. We're not talking you, the whole yard. If you can do that, great. But small areas are so beneficial. I have a tiny house that I live in here in um, Lincoln, and I have just the areas in the front yard against the house, right? Little garden strips, and then just a small area, maybe, you know, it's not even an acre. It's probably not even a half acre in the backyard that I kind of let go. Now, some of them are weedy, and some of them are native plants that I've planted, but just those small areas can make a huge difference. So that picture kind of shows you like just a small idea of how to plant, what to plant, um, for a little pollinator garden. And trust me, a pollinator garden, birds are going to love it too, because if it brings in the bugs, it'll bring in the birds. Something to think about if you do like this idea and you want to do it, you've got some space. Um, you don't need that much space in the picture. But think about um, the different levels of what you might want to plant. Because birds have niches, right? Does everybody know what like a niche is, right? That's where, like, you think about a white-throated sparrow or white-crowned sparrow that are here right now um, coming in for the winter. They like it on the ground, right, with some grasses around and some seeds. A little higher up right in a low shrub, you might have a scrub shrub bird like a tohi. A little higher up, you might get in the summer like your orioles. Right now, you might get the doves and the blue jays and the cardinals are higher up. So have those levels, right? Make sure if you can get a native tree or leave those with some shrubs around. Don't forget the grasses and the things that are ground cover, like one of my favorites, purple poppy mallow, right? That doesn't ever get super high, but it kind of curves underneath everything else. And one of my favorites, especially this time of the year, leave your leaf litter, even if it's some of it, right? If you need to like scoop up some, or if it's you rake in the front yard, but you leave the leaves in the back. What I like to do in my yard is I re uh, rake a small area, or if the wind has blown them all against my fence, I'll scoop those up, crumple them up, and either save them or put them in the garden beds near the um, plants that I've cut back. That is the best natural mulch. And all those bugs we're talking about, they're living underneath there in the winter. So many spiders, bumblebees, they need that leaf litter or an old log to get through the winter in, or at least to lay their larva in, which will then hatch out of next year. And if you want those bugs around to feed the birds, you've got to have some leaf litter and some log litter too. So don't forget that. It's an important part. If you have a bigger property, here's a really great, and it doesn't even matter the size. Ultimately, this is a really great pattern if you're not sure how to plant, um, like how to design. We've got a lot of great partners in the uh, states who can always contact us at Audubon, Nebraska and uh, we can give you some names of folks that can help you. But a really simple idea is what's called the bullseye. If you think of your home, right, as the center of a bullseye, each ring of a bullseye going out from there should start less wild. So right next to the home, right, you don't want to have all of the high grasses and everything right next to the home because then you have things hitting the building or close to your windows 
right? So that's where you can leave your space if you want to mow a little bit of lawn or a path. And then as you move out, it can get wilder and wilder. Um, it's really, really, really a really simple idea, but a really effective one for the wildlife. We mentioned this, right? The more you have native plants in your yard, yeah. the less pesticide you'll need. It is, All right. yeah. So that brings me to, so I've got somebody, just wanna remind folks that if you can stay on mute. There we go. Um, so this, brings me to the point of, so those are some of the things you can do. One of the questions we always get is, but what birds can I see? What if I want to specifically garden so that this bird or this bug will come to my yard? Now that could be its own presentation. Um, one of the best things to do is talk to someone that knows. Work with one of our partners at the Xerxes organization. We have two or three great uh, Xerxes uh, folks right here in Nebraska, uh, Ray Powers, um, Katie Lampke, Jennifer Hopwood up in Omaha, really great folks who can help you with the bugs and the plants that they need. Um, for birds, it's even simpler. We have put together a database, which I'm going to show you in a second at Audubon, and you can just put in your zip code. It knows by where you live a lot of the native plants that would grow there and which birds they're good for. Something to consider, and it's in that picture next to, it's like the little nut hatch is pointing to it. He's that don't forget this, which is before, if you haven't bought native plants before, make sure you know how they come from uh, the place you're going to buy them because they can be different prices. So if you're not sure, think about what your budget is and where you can start. That's why I always say start small. It can get overwhelming. Some plants, right, a large tree might come wrapped or bare root. Um, some that you're going to get from a larger chain store might come in a pot because they want to guarantee those but read the label, right? They may already come coated in a pesticide. Um, so you wanna watch that because that can be not good for the rest of your bugs if they wanna come eat on it, right? Um, so just check that. But one thing that's really great right now is we are getting more and more uh, plant sellers and garden centers and landscapers to use native plants. And you can help us with that by requesting them. If you go to a garden center and they don't have the native plant you want, ask them and say, hey, I really want this plant. You should sell more natives. Uh, I'm really interested in those. They're never going to do it if people don't ask. Um, but I know right here in Link, we have several partners and landscapers that we work with that sell almost all Nebraska native plants. Um, a couple to mention are Great Plains Nursery up by Valparaiso for trees and shrubs. Right here in Lincoln, where I'm at, um, there is Midwest Natives Nursery. K. Codis has Prairie Legacy. Um, even Campbell's we've been working with, which is more of a larger chain store, but they know that folks want them. So they have a native section that they've been working on and all of their staff actually came out to Spring Creek Prairie to learn more about um, the natives that are on a prairie that people might want, which I find really cool. All right, so here's a uh, quick example of that database. And it's really easy to find if you put in Audubon plants for birds in a Google search, it'll come up. Um, or if you go to the National Audubon website, plants for birds is one of the big uh, programs. And all you do, like I said, is you put your email address and a zip code in and you'll get a return that looks kind of like that. It's a lot longer, right? That's just a screenshot of what it would look like, but you'll get a list of native plants from your area, from grasses and forbs, all the way up to trees and shrubs and it, you'll see how on the right, there are some birds right here. It will tell you what birds will use those plants, and there's a lot more listed. If you check these tabs also, there are really great ways that you can filter and tab and see different results to help you out in your planning. So like if you wanted to specifically bring, let's say, pine siskins to your yard, what do they like, right? You could do this by putting in right here attracts what type of bird. You could drop down on that menu and put in pine siskin and it would take the list of native plants in your area and tell you what they would eat, right? Probably gonna be a conifer, right? Some sort of pine tree. They love those pine and conifer seeds. Um, but it's a really great tool. 
it's not going to give you all the answers, right? It, then it's not probably going to tell you how to plant them, but it's a really great place to start if you're not sure where to start, which is what birds do I want to see? Or what plants do I have that, you know, certain birds like? I put a few of my favorite birds. I picked, I think, three. Um, they all tend to be neotropical migrants for some reason. I seem to like those. I should pick some that are going to be here all year round. Um, but these are three that people don't think of as suburban birds always, and they totally are. You can get them to your backyard if you have enough space and the right types of habitat. So that brown thrasher, lovely bird, one of the best singers in Nebraska, right? When they show up every spring, just singing so many different songs, really gorgeous. They want a thicket with some thorny, thick stuff to hide in and make their messy nest in. So plum thicket or mulberry might take a space, might take the gardener, unlike me, who doesn't like it to look neat, right? Who can allow it to look a little messy because where they live looks a little messy and wild. What's really cool too, and if you've never seen them do it, Thrashers do this, mockingbirds do this, and woodpeckers in the winter. The smooth sumac, if you have an area that you can control it, right? They can kind of keep it mowed around it so it doesn't spread too much. Those berries aren't super nutritious, but they're very dense. And a lot of insects and spiders hide inside that uh, berry bunch for the winter to get out of the wind and the snow and the rain, and the birds know it. So smooth sumac, I found out by watching the birds closely, is a really great one, not necessarily because they eat the berries, but because there are bugs hiding in that tiny berry, like, because those berries are so tight. Next one, gorgeous uh, bird that is here also, um, spring through the uh, fall, is orchard orioles. This is one most people don't see in their yards. They're a little trickier, but again, it's because they need that mid-story shrub thicket, right? They love dogwoods and plums. And this one, I bet many of you have seen because they come to feeders, right? They love to come and get some jelly or some oranges at the feeders, but they will nest right in your yard too if you have the right kind of native trees that have enough leaf cover that hang down so that they can weave that gorgeous hanging basket of a nest. Another one of many people's favorites. Little trivia for those that don't know, just because I did not know this and I did another presentation. Does anybody know where it gets its name, Baltimore Oriole? It's not necessarily from the city. It's from Lord Baltimore, his coat of arms, who Baltimore the city was named after, is orange and black. And uh, when they got here, they thought it looked like that and named the bird after him. That's where it comes from. Last one, ruby-throated hummingbird. Not super common uh, in this side of the state, but you can see them and you will see them more or luckily have them come to your yard with a few of those native plants. Hummingbirds are specifically love native plants, not only for bugs, but because they need those spiders and spider web to make their nest. So they want those native spiders on native plants and that's just some of their favorite, right? To nectar on, they love cardinal flowers and the salvias and bergamots, right? Just like the bees do. Or anybody know that one he's sitting on? I bet many of you do. That is butterfly milkweed, right? One of the milkweeds. And it's a really great one, um, not only for nectar, but because so many bugs like it, so do the hummingbirds. So we're just about done and we'll get to some questions here in just a bit, but I wanted to show you how much this can actually make a difference. So this is a picture from a little little patch in my yard. That's some poppy mallow you can see right there before our Plants for Birds sign. And I want to mention that sign. We have them. Normally you have to buy them from Audubon nationally, um, but we have a bunch for this reason, the Plants for Bird program. So if you already have native plants in your yard and have birds using them, all you have to do is send me a picture of that and we can send you a, a sign like that for free um, because that's great education. The more you have a sign out that you have native plants, more people know about and you can talk about your, with your neighbors or your uh, um, neighborhood association, et cetera, on why you do that. Um, and it lets people know that that's important to you. But check that out. My tiny little yard in Lincoln in just, it's only been 
about, how long have I been here? Six years now. I have seen 96 species of bird in just from my yard. And I really believe that a lot of that is because I have native plants growing, right? I would say the first few years, there was a lot of birds, but they've even more types of species have I found because they've come into some of the thickets of native trees and plants that I have in and around my neighborhood, which is very exciting. So again, it doesn't take that much. Even if you don't have a yard, right? We have to remember many people in urban areas, you might not get a yard if you're living in an apartment, townhouse, etc. So this young lady in Baltimore said, you know, I really miss seeing butterflies and birds. She used to live in another area where she had more space. And this is her whole, that's pretty much her whole backyard in her townhouse. So what she did was make planters and hung them everywhere. So don't forget, even a window box can make a difference. If it's a native plant in there, right, with bugs coming to it, and a bird can then eat that bu uh, bug when it's flying away, you can get this. And what's exciting about this one to me is Teresa, when she did this, all of a sudden her neighbors started noticing butterflies flying above her backyard and coming in, birds going into her backyard. And they're like, what's going on over there? How come she's getting all the cool stuff? Her whole block now looks like this in the backyard. It completely changed her whole neighborhood block by one person just planting a few things and hanging some stuff up because she wanted to make a difference. And if you want to go whole hog, if you've got a property where you feel like, you know, you want to get a lot, this is where you can go. This is my good friend Ben Vogt uh, at Monarch Gardens front yard. Both his front and backyard are native restored prairie. One word of caution on this, though, is know your town or your homeowners association. Know your rules, right? He knows them really, really well. You will probably get folks who don't like to look at it and you know, report you to the county weed board. If you follow the rules correctly, you can have a complete prairie in your yard if you want. Again, we're not saying you have to do all of that. It's certainly amazing and it's certainly beautiful. He has paths through them um, and uh, water bubblers and all kinds of great things for the birds, but every little bit helps. Last thing I want to talk to you is something that if gardening isn't what you do, or if you already are doing this, there's a really cool thing that we've added to the Plants for Birds program called Plants for Birds Pro, P-R-O, and that stands for Proclamations, Resolutions, and Ordinances. This is another way that you can help. Maybe if you're like me, green, I never thought I had much of a green thumb. I love it now that I'm getting into it, especially when I see all the bugs that I'm learning and the birds using the habitat. But before I didn't, but what I can do is use my voice, right? I can say and know the research and advocate for the use of native plants, maybe by city municipalities, by homeowners associations, et cetera, right? So the Plants for Birds program is a lot of what I just talked about. This is just reiterating many of those things that are really great and why they're important, right? reducing all those heating effects and energy demands, less water use, right? All of those things that are going to be super important as we continue trying to mitigate uh, climate change. And this is the part I really love, which is, and I have to big, a big shout out to Bob and the team at Audubon Society of Omaha. They just passed their resolution. Woo -woo! Um, so we have two of our Audubon chapters, Wachiska and Audubon Society of Omaha, who have passed resolutions to have their membership learn about Plants for Birds, right? Advocate for using native plants more, right, within their membership. Um, so we are thrilled with that. And this is a really great and easy way that we can um, get the word out more and have more people so that it's not just one yard that has a native area, but maybe it starts being five or six and sooner or later, it's like the town, I always forget the name of it. It's a little town in Colorado. It's only about 5,000 people, not a huge little town. But they passed an ordinance where everyone in town must use at least 10% in their landscape, in their yard, have at least 10% native plants, right? That's actually a huge bit if you add up 5,000 people, right, must have 10% in their yard. That's a big shift in habitat for birds and bugs. 
So some things you can do is like uh, over wildflower week this past year, we got the governor to sign a proclamation about the importance of native plants for pollinators and birds, right? Native wildflowers, very important, right? Resolutions, right? Getting a group or a club that can resolve to ask their membership to do a little bit more or to say why it's important. Down to the toughest, but the most important ones, which are ordinances. Getting folks to work with their city council, with their city weed ordinance or county state weed uh, invasive species folks, right? Maybe if it's a homeowners association, working with those rules and say, hey, you know, can we get a few more native plants on that plant list that we're allowed to use and here's why, right? Just kind of using your voice to advocate for the use of native plants can be another really important way to uh, help in this uh, sort of way to get more habitat for our birds to be around, to be seen and heard uh, in the suburban or what I remember like to call the suburbia area. And with that, I just wanted to pop this up there. If you are like me and you like to take pictures of resources, those are a few names of the bird books I mentioned, um, some links directly to those uh, native plant databases. I'm going to leave that one up there because the next one is just a simple thank you. But I think what we'll do is, how did I do on time? I felt like I zoomed right through that. Well, you, oh, pretty good. Yeah, I had 45 minutes. That's pretty good. Perfect, because it leaves us a little time for questions. I would love to have some questions if anyone has any. The best way to do that probably is to drop them in the chat. Or um, if you um, can unmute for a second and just say, hey, bird nerd. What about this? Um, please do so. You know, I had one question, Jason, and I kind of followed you online with your your uh, transformation of your yard, and you mm -hmm. you kind of answered it. You said it, you've been working at it for about six years now. I mean, what should people be able to expect? Kind of incremental change. I mean, is that something that can happen, kind of year to year? Is that kind of how you worked at it, or? Yeah, so the first thing I would recommend is definitely find someone who knows more than you do about native plants first, right? Whether it's the store you decide to buy them from, a local landscaper. I'm lucky I work for Audubon. We already had partners who know more than I do about them. So I just like email up Ben Vogt or Kay Kodis and say, hey, what about this plant? Will that grow in my yard? Is that good for whatever? Um, but also all of these little tools that Audubon has created, I use them. They work great, right? Um, the one thing I will say is don't expect immediate results. And that's kind of the same with any gardening or landscaping, right? It can look really rough right away, or it might be like, wow, nothing's happening. I thought that would be better. It's only the last two years that things have really started looking like quote unquote habitat, right? Where I can see the rabbits are in there every night. I can see that like I had a thrasher literally thinking about a nest in the thicket in the back, right? Like it's like, Seeing that this year, seeing weird birds that I never expected to see in an urban backyard. Like I had a Harris's sparrow come through my yard. That's, they really don't like urban areas, right? They like it a little wilder, right? And out in the open. Um, so find, you know, seeing things like that like has really helped, but don't rush it and start small. That's the other thing. I started with just two tiny strip gardens that are about eight foot long, right? And then each year I would add to those a little and I added another space in the backyard so that each year new things would happen and don't be afraid to fail. Like sometimes there's things that's like, oh, that didn't grow here, right? Try something else, right? Yeah. And 96, um, 96 species is nothing to sneeze at for a yard list. Man, that's pretty yeah. impressive. I will say, don't forget, my other specialty is birding by ear. So some of those... <laughs> <laughs> yes. I never heard them or they were flying over. So I can't yeah. say it was the native plant okay. specific. <laughs> yeah. I see lots of things coming in the chat. I'm going to check out the chat. Yeah, go, go, ahead. chat. go ahead. I'm out. Let's see here. Let's so see. One more resource for native plants and how to's is the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum. Absolutely, Michelle Foss. That's totally true. Bob Henriksen and Justin Everson over there are great friends of mine. Um, they have done actually native plant walks and talks with me. Um, they are a great resource, and especially for anyone else working at a uh, nonprofit or with a club, they're great because they have a Green Cities program that you can get some money for to actually get some of the plants. 
and get some more native plants in the ground. Um, really, really, really cool. Um, let's see, looking to add a North Star cherry tree in the Suburbia backyard, what birds that might that attract? Well, I would certainly say cherry, anything with fruit. Think about robins, thrushes like catbirds, um, and uh, cedar waxwings, right? Really, really great. My mom has a, not quite the same, but right, has a choke, ch choke cherry? No, she has a crab apple tree. And it is the most popular thing in her South Dakota backyard. She's a little north of us right now because they had snows, right? So right after an ice storm, right, that we all had a few days ago, they had a little worse up north of us. Um, all those frozen crab apples, which aren't super delicious any other time, are the only food around, right? I can't get through the snow. It is so popular. So I would definitely think your cherry tree, especially in the winter for resident birds, when it snows or when it ices, if there's still things on it, they're going to love it. Not to mention the blossoms in the spring. Going to bring tons of pollinators and native bees to those um, flowers when it blooms. That's going to mean birds too. So very, very cool. Where can I find, John's asking, where can I find native prairie and other plants native to the area that are not cultivars? Aha, good question. We did, I didn't talk about cultivars too much. Here's what I'll say about cultivars. Um, if it's all you can find, look at what the cultivar is. What was it cultivated for? Let me explain. I have a cultivar in my front yard of the aronia shrub, uh, chokeberry, right? It's a really great shrub, but they grow really, really big. I couldn't have a nine foot, you know, 10 foot wide shrub in my tiny little house front yard. There is one that is cultivated just to be dwarf. Everything else is the same. So that cultivar is still beneficial. It's bringing berries. It's still got the same flower and everything. Might be still okay to use. The cultivars to be wary are, of are those where it changes the color of the flower, um, which in that chemistry might change the nectar. Like there's a lot of ups and downs to it. Um, are some of the bees still attracted to it if the flower is a different color? Like, there's a lot of things they're not sure of on the cultivar. There's a lot more research that I don't even understand on them. Places to look are going directly to the arboretum and asking, doing the research, knowing what is the name of the non-cultivar, um, and then go to a place that has seed where they're growing their plants from native plant seeds. Um, I don't know, and Bob, maybe you can help me or someone up there, Michelle might know too, um, in the Omaha area, but I'll give you a couple examples in Lincoln, which are like Prairie Legacy, that's Kay Codis's work. She ultimately has a native prairie. So the plants she's growing are seeded there and then she grows them in her house from natural seed. So none of those are cultivars. Those are native prairie plants. Uh, Midwest Natives does most of that too. Um, where you're gonna find a lot of the cultivars, again, is in the big chain stores because they wanna guarantee their plant, right? One of the reasons it costs more is they want you to enjoy it and they they have that uh, return policy where you can bring it back if it doesn't live right but to do that they've had to do some things they've grown at a certain size so just kind of you know just be wary of that be prepared um, but that's a really good question um, again it doesn't mean you can't enjoy your ornamental plants in your landscaping i'm not saying don't use them i'm saying get a better balance, right? Look in your yard and see where you can get more natives or more of them thicked in and mixed in, right? Let's see. I was, I was looking at the rest of his question there. We talking about who can you contact? Um, mm -hmm. Jennifer Hopwood, which Jason mentioned, is, is the Xerxes person here in Omaha. And we've had her for programming and she's excellent. She does a really, really good job. Gave us a good talk, oh, about maybe a little over a year ago. And she, uh, she, she gives talks around town. But if you contact the Xerxes Society here in Omaha, I'm sure they would. There's another person as well, but but Jennifer is very active, so you should be healthy out. As well, Fontenelle Forest has two biologists yes. who yes. also do. Um, neighbor consultations. Actually, this is Michelle Foss. I'm the Director of Stewardship and Research at Fontenelle. So we do that. Also, three of the staff members in the Land Stewardship Program are on the Audubon Society of Omaha board. So awesome. um, we can help you out too. 
and the Thank county you. the county extension as well here in town mm -hmm. there's an office on center street and what is that about 78 something like that uh in center. Uh, yeah yeah exactly so yeah that's a that's a good um a good resource as well and they, and they could they're helpful but yeah fontanelle is, a, is an excellent resource i don't know why i didn't think of that actually i'm finding more people uh don't seem to mind if it's a cultivar versus a native and yeah. uh, a lot of people have no idea where i can get the natives uh and actually extension many times is not so helpful in that regard, unfortunately. Uh, and I've been stung with a number of nurseries that uh, claim natives only to find that as um, Jason said, uh, that's, you know, a magenta flower is not on a New England aster <laughs> yeah. and, and other things like that, that uh, pollinators and all this won't even deal with. So, uh, yeah, and I've seen that personally. They, so I'm really yeah, struggling to get the native genotypes and preserve those as much as I can for the purpose you're describing. Yeah, no, it can be very tricky. And that's one of the reasons why the education portion, right, is so important. Um, some things you can do is, is if the place you usually have bought those plants doesn't have what you need, just keep asking. Just be like, oh, hey, yeah, I have. this is what I need. <laughs> this is what I need. And I really don't want to go to fine places like um, Prairie Moon, Moon Nursery in, in they're, they're purists. But, you know, mm -hmm. the genotype, and you don't want to do too much of that mix unless you're really desperate. But yeah. that's me. Good questions, though. Um, and you can also, like, just to add, I know, like, I bet Michelle agrees with this, Bob agrees with this. If you forget, who to call or some of the things we've mentioned, send us an email. We love answering these kind of questions. We love to say, oh my God, that's Kay Cotis, go to her. Or no, please call Michelle Fonts up at you know Fontenelle Forest. They would love to help you out. They've got a team there. Like there's so many of us that all work together and we are headed towards the same goals. We want to get more people doing this. So it doesn't matter if I'm helping with it or you're like, so. Can you recommend a small native tree less than 10 feet tall? So this is where it becomes tricky, which is I'm still not the plant expert, right? I'm the bird expert. What I will say on small tree, that's pretty short. I would consider a shrub maybe instead of an actual tree to keep that small. Um, because I feel like if you're gonna look for a tree that that is that small, it's probably gonna be something that's ornamental that isn't originally from here. Most of the trees I think of that are native, I mean, ultimately, there's really two trees that are native to Nebraska, right? Cottonwoods and bur oaks. That's the main one. There's a lot more that are naturalized that have come in and that are still really great native trees from around North America. Um, shrub wise though, for 10 feet or under, there's some really good ones. I mentioned some that are a little thickety, right? Plums and um, dogwoods. Um, I put a viburnum shrub that's only going to get to about seven to eight feet in my yard. That's a really, really great native uh, shrub, uh, viburnum bush. Um, I mentioned the aronia, right? The chokeberry. Berries, I know sometimes people don't love. They can be a little messy depending on where you plant it. So don't forget that part. Where am I planting this? Is it going to be over the driveway? Don't put the berry brush over the driveway, right? You're going to be mad about that when it's staining your car or falling on your head and getting on your nice shirt, right? So think about where you're putting things. Um, uh, you know, or the birds are eating it and they're pooping the lovely cat bird, you know, staining purple on your car or something else. Good questions, guys. Any more? That's all that I see in the chat right now. Anybody else have any? I don't see any more in there. Well, Jason, thank you very much. As usual, this was a wonderful talk. I really helpful, and I, you know, I, and I scheduling it in the middle of the winter. Oh, I I got one more question here. What about a service berry? I just saw that Elizabeth Fullerton put that up. Yes, it's a great shrub. Uh, service berry is a really really good one. We have uh, not as much. We used to have more out in the prairie. It tends to like 
but it's a good one that likes urban and suburban areas. So service fairy is a really nice one. Um, but yeah, but yes, thank you so much, Bob, for uh, been great. And, I, and and you're not out of place in the middle of the winter was what I was trying to say. It's always a good. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, yeah, so thanks again everybody. to Audubon Society of Omaha for um, passing your native plant resolution. Send me questions if you've got them. I'm going to throw a really easy, we have an easy email to remember. It's just our initials, Spring Creek Prairie, scp at audubon.org. And Bob can probably attest to this. I love getting questions, whether it's about native plants or bird identification or anything. Um, Kevin and I, who run the, that email, love getting the questions. So if you have them, send us the questions and we will do our best to find you the information or the answer because that's what we do. So I can, um, Yeah, I can attest. He's, he's a very good resource and he never gets frustrated. So I've tried, but I, I can't. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Yeah, and thank, thank everybody you for so coming. Much. Yeah, next month we have uh, uh, Jim Lockler from uh, Lawrence and Gardens. He's the conservation director there, and he'll talk about 20 years of uh, developing Lawrence and Gardens, which is about the about the lifespan that it has had here in Omaha. And uh, I want to say to everybody with with great regret that we've had to cancel the Christmas bird count this year because of COVID. It, we just can't really make it work. And that, that's okay. I'm planning on doing a talk on the backyard bird count for February. And I'll work that in sometime. So just for future reference. Thanks everybody for coming and thanks for all your, your kind comments and thanks especially to Jason. And I think we, we can probably, looks like we got everybody's questions answered. Good deal. Thanks again, Jason. You bet. Thanks everybody. Thank you.